British and Canadian Battles in France, 1915. Part 3. Festubert. Section B. This is not war, it is simply murder. The attack on Canadian Orchard and K5. This is a continuation from Tim Cook's book, At the Sharp End. Hundreds of Canadian corpses and wounded men lay uncleared on the battlefield. The survivors were digging in under life and limb shattering fire. In the rear, First Army Headquarters ordered another attack for May 20th. It was set for 7.45 p.m. Just as the sky would slip into dusk, but again without the cover of darkness. Brigadier Richard Turner and Lieutenant Colonel R.G. Leckie of the 16th Battalion could scarcely believe their orders. It had already been proven that sending forward troops against prepared defenses in the light of day was akin to suicide. Turner wrote to Alderson's headquarters to ask for a later start time, suggesting a night attack at 10.15 p.m. When he received no reply, the desperate brigadier even went to divisional headquarters to see Alderson in person. The general refused to meet him, but Turner confronted senior staff officer Lieutenant Colonel G.C. Gordon Hall, stating that he had crawled forward through the muck and surveyed the ground, and that his battalion commanders had told him the attack could not succeed as currently planned. Uncut barbed wire had been discovered by an infantry patrol and Turner had been informed by frontline officers that not only had patrols been prevented from crossing some of the waterlogged ditches, but one man had drowned. Turner was nonetheless ordered to proceed. The Canadian Divisional Staff indeed seemed to deserve their reputation as callous incompetence, out of touch with troops at the front. This was a distinction that had been intensified since the beginning of the war. But it should be noted that they were under pressure from their British superiors. The Corps and Army Headquarters were even further removed from the reality of the front, and General Haig was pushed equally hard by his French allies to renew the attack. The objections of a number of battalion commanding officers and their brigadier were not going to register with an army commander, but the Canadian Divisional Headquarters, and specifically Alderson, should have made a stronger case in the men's defense, at least arguing for an adjusted attack time. But as commander of a fresh division at the front, Alderson lacked the willpower to force the issue. The general had in fact tentatively broached the subject of the delay in order to give his artillery adequate time to break the German defenses. But in response, he had received a personal visit from an impatient Haig who had questioned his judgment and ability to carry out an offensive operation. Alderson had folded before the veiled threat. The attack would not be called off. Turner returned to his men with the bad news, but not before he thundered to the divisional headquarters staff that the operation was little more than murder. Expectations that artillery would destroy or suppress German fire had already proven to be misplaced during the attack two days earlier, and to order a 700 meter assault against a frontal position using exhausted soldiers was nothing short of criminal. But almost a year of military training had prepared soldiers to accept orders without question. The infantry at the sharp end might have thought their assault was part of a larger offensive, or a feint, 
a greater goal that might justify their sacrifice. Sadly, this was not the case. But the Canadians remained unaware of the reality of the situation and obeyed their orders. Besides, fatigue had numbed some of the men into indifference to their fate. One infantryman of the 16th Battalion wrote, Before the attack yesterday, I was dead tired. I didn't know how I could make it. But when the fight started and they opened up on us, I didn't care one damn. They could do what they like with me. I went on indifferent to my surroundings. And I was thinking quite clearly, too. The 16th Battalion and the Fresher 15th, which was brought into the line from reserve, moved into the front trenches. But the Canadian artillery barrage leading up to the start time was weak and episodic. Even the infantry waiting to go over the top could sense its ineffectiveness. As the attack time neared, the bombardment reached a brief fury and then stopped. At 7.45 p.m., the officers' whistles could be heard across the battlefield. The Canadians climbed out of their trenches, advancing in waves with two or three meters between men. In accordance with the doctrine of the time, the barrage had stopped before the initiation of the attack, which meant that almost no supporting barrage of shells or small arms fire was being used to keep the Germans down in their own fortified front lines. Two Canadian Colt machine guns had been added to supplement the artillery fire, but the first position was almost immediately sniped by Germans, who well understood the gun's effectiveness and the second was obliterated by a high explosive artillery shell. Little additional firepower was mobilized to assist the infantry. Going over the top was a terrifying event, but discipline took over and soldiers went forward. Many described the surreal quality of bullets whizzing past them, shells exploding, and men falling all around them. Still they advanced, crawling, walking and stepping over barbed wire, moving around the smoking craters, barely looking down at the red stained heaps of rags and jutting bone that had once been men. Acrid smoke caught in the throat. Eyes were dry as soldiers fought to blink. Time ultimately stood still and sped fast in an experience both unsettling and dreamlike. In looking back at the mad minutes in no man's land, or the hours in a shattered enemy's trench, the Highlanders of the 15th and 16th battalions might only be able to reconstruct a few images. A red poppy in a sea of mud. A friend torn open and crying for help. The rustle of the wind on the back of a sweaty neck. In some ways, being out of the trenches unencumbered by the terrible stress of waiting, was easier for the men, even though this position was far more dangerous. The Canadians displayed iron discipline in the face of small arms fire that fell, as one attacker noted in his diary, like sleep. The German Maxim machine gun, which is similar, if slightly inferior, to the British Vickers machine gun, swept the battlefield with about 500 rounds a minute. It had a heavy sledge mount that resembled a stretcher, and more than a few Entente soldiers were tricked into not firing at machine gunners moving into position, as they appeared to be medical orderlies. Dug in and advantaged by a commanding view of the ground, the German gunners laid down a devastating arc of fire, and Advancing Canadian infantrymen were hit repeatedly as they fell to the ground. That anyone could survive such a hurricane of fire seemed unbelievable, but still the Canadians advanced on the enemy, finding gaps in the barbed wire, firing from their five-round clip, 
and then alternately running and crawling forward. But the gaps in the opening waves became wider and wider. Captain Frank Morrison of the 16th Battalion's C Company reported that he and his men ran into the grave obstacle of a creek eight feet wide and four feet deep. A hedge lined the other side with only two small openings through which to pass, both of which were covered by machine guns. The jocks, as Highlanders like to call themselves, pushed through single file, but took terrible casualties. Those who made it to the other side soon built up a weight of fire that eventually knocked out the enemy guns. But the cost in casualties was high. Amidst the horror of men being torn apart, infantrymen could glimpse a few startled rabbits hopping along in these old farmers' fields. A strange pastoral sight in a war of industrialized fury. Private Herbert Durand, a former railway brakesman, from New Liskeard, Ontario, wrote, When we made the attack, the bullets were so thick that I thought that it was sure death for me. The three fellows who went ahead of me were killed as soon as they got over, and I had to crawl over them, and wherever I looked, someone was falling. In Durand's platoon, 22 of the 23 men were killed or wounded, and the survivors went to ground as their officers were all killed. But other platoons pushed forward. Crossing water-filled ditches and trenches, the Canadians drove through the outer German lines, bayoneted and shooting the enemy. Sergeant Jock Thompson, one of the favorite non-commissioned officers of the 15th, single-handedly charged a machine gun that was raking his men. He nearly succeeded, but was shot down only meters from the position. Another group of men crept forward during Thompson's charge and were able to knock out the gun. The Canadians made a slow advance, but often only as a result of terrible sacrifices. Private Thomas Hanna, who had enlisted in the 15th Battalion at the age of 41 in the first months of the war, wrote home to a friend, This is not war, it is simply murder. During the daylight attack, it was held let loose. Shrapnel, machine guns, and rifles all at us at once. But we went through it at an awful cost. And I believe I am the luckiest man in the world today. For after we got to the trench, there were 18 of us between traverses when a shell got us, and 16 of us went down. I have often read of the battlefield, but this beats everything. What I have seen would turn men's hair white. By the end of the night, the survivors of the 16th Battalion had captured the orchard, which had been enclosed in thick hedges and ditches and strengthened with barbed wire. The 15th Battalion had been stopped short of their assigned trenches. These were the two German concentrations labeled L11 and L-12 on their maps, but they had also overrun a number of difficult positions. The Highlanders' occupation of the orchard was the farthest point reached by British forces in the Battle of Festubert, and the location was therefore renamed Canadian Orchard in their honour. But the battle had cost the four companies an estimated 250 casualties, and in a testament to the futile nature of the operation, even this farthest point was soon pulled back to straighten out the line to avoid enfilade fire shooting from the flank. In his report to Alderson, Turner noted a feeling in the brigade that unnecessary heavy casualties were incurred on account of the hour at which the attack was ordered. This was the hard truth, but it won Turner few friends at Division Headquarters. With 
his second brigade located on the right flank of Turner's third. Brigadier Arthur Curry was ordered to coordinate an attack of his brigade in conjunction with Turner's, even though the original plan had not called for an operation by Curry's brigade until the next day. Working on a shortened timetable hurt the ability of Curry's men to reconnoiter the ground, identify potential strong points, or plot courses through the wire. And such reconnoitering was based on the assumption that they could even find their objectives. The second brigade had been ordered to capture K5, a junction of new and old German trenches not distinguished on any map and not even visible to the Canadian officers who crawled through the mud and barbed wire in the dark. Frustrated and confused by orders that could not be carried out, Curry roared to several officers that the son of a bitch who wrote this order never saw a trench. Curry was no less fed up with the British and Canadian artillery, whose failure to knock out the enemy's big guns had left the troops in the front line weakly supported. No stranger to a good profanity-laden outburst, Curry frothed. The damned artillery don't fire on each other, but on the infantry, on either side. He was correct for the most part, and captured German artillery doctrinal orders, observed that targeting an enemy's front line was far more profitable than hunting in the rear for hidden guns. The gunners on both sides lacked ammunition and expertise, but at Festerberg, the Canadian gunners had also been situated too far to the rear by Alderson's divisional staff. They were nearly blind since most of the forward observers were not close enough to the front, and those few who were there to correct the fall of shells often could not send reliable coordinates back along the unreliable telephone wires. Along the front, the enemy's barbed wire seemed almost untouched, although thousands of shells had been fired, most were ineffective, becoming buried in the ground and exploding beneath the wire, because the fuses were not sensitive enough to detonate the shells on contact wire had simply been tossed around, creating enormous tumbleweeds of sharp metal. Uncut barbed wire would remain a grave problem until more high explosive shells were produced in 1916, followed by more sensitive fuses early in the next year. On the night of May 19th, infantry intelligence patrols had informed Curry that not only were the enemy trenches seemingly untouched by shell fire, but most of the barbed wire remained. Curry attempted to have the attack delayed until more guns could be brought up to provide a suitable bombardment. Inexperienced and unsure of how to press his demand, Curry received a flat rejection from divisional headquarters, as had Turner. A uh, dejected and frustrated Curry selected two companies of the 10th Battalion and a small party of grenadiers from the 5th Battalion to go forward. This was far too small a force to achieve any success against a fortress like K-5, and one suspects that Curry, aware of the hopeless situation, was not willing to commit more men to the futile expedition. As a location, K-5 meant nothing to the soldiers at the front. It could neither be spotted by forward observers nor be found on the inaccurate maps. K-5, with parapets that were three to six meters thick in places, was almost untouched in the preparatory bombardment. Worse, Curry's two infantry companies of Calgarians were crowded in battered forward trenches where the parapet and sandbags were knocked about, allowing snipers to take out victim after victim. Even inexperienced troops could smell blood in the air. 
In the hours before the assault, two heavy 9.2 inch howitzers that were to have bombarded K-5 were redirected away from the target for fear that such a bombardment might alert the Germans to the objective of the attack. Such concern was unwarranted, however, as the Germans were already well aware of the, pen, the impending operation. Situated on Augers Ridge, the enemy was able to look down into the Canadian and British lines and see exactly where they were forming up. At 7.45 p.m., the 10th Battalion was forced to attack in full view of the enemy and with no protective barrage. With the high command completely unaware of the battlefield conditions and the soldiers at the sharp end not even sure as to the direction in which they were to attack, the officers at the front found to their horror the only way forward was through a narrow communication trench. Only one man could fit down and through it at a time, although the bullets continued to whiz over the heads of all troops. After several dozen infanteers had emerged from the same spot, the Germans began to train their fire on the exit. The fighting 10th advanced into a death trap in which even a handful of enemy riflemen could have taken apart the two companies. With only a limited number of men making it beyond the exit of the communication trench, the forward company advanced the line a pitiful 100 meters. But most of the officers had been gunned down within minutes, and the last surviving company commander called off the suicidal attack. Interestingly, the Grenadiers of the 5th Battalion appear to have taken matters into their own hands. No record indicates that they left the relative safety of the trench for the slaughter ground beyond. The insignificant 100 meter advance achieved in this operation was a result of the ferocity of enemy fire, but also the Calgarians' decision to go to ground and stay there no doubt exercising their own judgment in the hopeless battle. In his official report, Curry refused to mince words. He said, the attack was a complete failure. After the Canadian operation was stopped dead by enemy fire, General Alderson and Senior Staff Officer Lieutenant Colonel G.C. Gordon Hall were forced to present themselves to Haig. Gordon Hall recounted, the general sat at a small table at his headquarters while we stood in front of him like a pack of schoolboys. The normally unemotional head raged at the failure of the attacks on the hostile position. Alderson tried to explain the difficulties, but Haig simply stormed and declared, the enemy must be driven from his position. Yet he offered no proposals as to how this was to be done, although he was liberal in pouring scorn on the efforts of the Canadians. Haig felt that they had given up too easily in taking K-5. Gordon Hall intervened, arguing that additional attacks would only result in further useless slaughter, pointing out that inaccurate artillery fire and timid gunners both British and Canadian, located safely in the rear, had abandoned the front-line troops to their fate. Haig ignored him and ordered the Canadians to mount another attack. Gordon Hall's protest went unknown to battalion commanders such as Turner and Curry, but it certainly left him marked in Haig's eyes, and the staff officer never advanced beyond his rank of lieutenant colonel. At the front, K-5 was being further reinforced by elite German troops. In addition to the north of the position near Canadian Orchard, a fortified house at M-10 remained unhit by shell fire, and the Canadians suspected enemy there 
would pour enfilading fire into any advance. But the Canadians had too few artillery and machine guns to destroy the position or suppress fire coming from it. With this grim prospect, Curry's troops prepared for a third assault. On May 21st, the attack was to begin at daybreak, but the artillery had been unable to coordinate their action with the infantry. The operation was therefore postponed until 8.30 that evening. But once again, the sky was still light enough for the German machine gunners to work their devilry. Supported by a weak and sporadic barrage, the infantry was left to its fate. Two companies of the, of the unlucky 10th were called on again, supported by the 1st Brigade's Grenade Company, a specialist unit that brought together men from the brigade's four battalions to conduct the dangerous work of tossing hand grenades. Bravery got the fighting tent out of the trenches, but before they set off across no man's land, their officers felt it necessary to line them up as per ex existing doctrine. They carried out this process in the face of sweeping enemy fire, which, according to E.J. Ashton, the ranking officer leading the attack, almost annihilated the two platoons on the left and caused heavy casualties to those filing to the right. The troops exhibited iron discipline as they stood and waited for the companions to emerge from the trenches even as bullets were tearing into their ranks. This type of discipline would not have been out of place at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, but the weapons of war had become considerably more deadly over the intervening hundred years, and the fact that any of the tenth survived in the open was something of a miracle. When enough men had lined up, they advanced, moving in leaps and bounds, they pushed forward, but they lost comrades at every step. Still they drove on, going to ground to lay down fire, and then moving forward again. But the battlefield afforded few places to hide from the growing weight of enemy fire. While the force on the left was largely annihilated, that on the right cleared 400 meters of trench in fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. However, the strong point of K-5 refused to fall. With the Germans temporarily retreating, the surviving Canadians set to construct constructing sandbag walls, reversing the trench fire steps, tearing them up and rebuilding them on the side of the trench that now faced the enemy, caring for the wounded, and consolidating their ammunition. They waited for the storm, and soon it came. Throughout May 22nd, the 10th beat back uncoordinated counterattacks along the enemy's communication trenches. Having failed to break the Canadian blocks in the trenches, the, Canadian, the Germans came at them over land. But they found this approach no more successful. Three times the Germans launched major attacks and three times they were cut down by massed Ross and Lee Enfield rifle fire, disproving the widely held belief that the former was useful only as a club. Private Sidney Cox recalled with some delight, We really murdered them for a while. The Canadians had a toehold in the German lines. But this game caused little more than a ripple to the enemy's position. The Germans still had the strategic high ground, and both sides were unwilling to end the battle. A lot of murder was still left for both sides to carry out at Festerberg. The gates of hell opened. Festerberg, May 22nd to 24th. Private Herbert Durand wrote, this life is sure hell, 
I don't know the minute I may get shot. Sometimes the bullets are so thick that it is just like a big rainstorm. And when I am writing this, the shrapnel is exploding over our heads every minute, and pieces of steel and iron are falling all around us. The reinforcements could not be moved forward to relieve the exposed troops. Ahead, behind, and to the left and to the right, the shells fell in a steady stream. Every man hugged the trench walls as the scrotum tightening, bow loosening explosions crashed all around him. The survivors of the assault on May 21st, the 10th Battalion, now reinforced by the 5th and 7th Battalions, were wasting away under the all day artillery onslaught. Ammunition was fired off. Water ran out as terrified men built their last reserves. Wounded men cried out in agony, and the stench of the dead overpowered the living. Some men grimly held on while others began to break down, whimpering at first, then sobbing quietly. Private George Bell wrote later, looking back from his position as a veteran of the entire war, not all men behave in the same manner under fire. Our battalion, like all others, had those who liked to be considered hard-boiled. They were the ones picking fights back of the lines and telling how tough they were. But often, these men, toughest back of the line, were weakest when they came to the crucial moment of making an advance, and often the most mild-mannered men made the best soldiers. Under the bombardment, it took an iron will to hold on to one's sanity. About 200 cases of shell shock were reported during and immediately after the Festivert battle. With the Canadians outgunned, several Colt machine guns had been brought forward and placed in secondary positions to consolidate the ground. These provided important fire support, and the machine gun teams fired off belt after belt, the barrels glowing red hot. But the new guns also became, became the targets of the Germans, who recognized their important role, and snipers soon began to make the exposed gunners pay for their bravery. Jock Palmer who earned a Distinguished combat, Conduct Medal for recklessly exposing himself by resting his machine gun on the parapet and fighting off a series of German counterattacks throughout the day, remarked, It was simply the gates of hell opened, everything let loose at once. Palmer's bravery kept the enemy at bay in his sector even though the fact that he avoided being shot in the upper body or head at some point during the battle was perhaps a minor miracle. While the infantry fought for their lives, the artillery again failed to suppress enemy artillery fire. With counter-battery fire in its infancy, gunners found it difficult to target enemy guns that were kilometers away and hidden by folds of ground or by camouflage. And so these unsuppressed guns relentlessly pounded the exposed Canadian infantry. Haig visited Alderson's headquarters to communicate once again his displeasure at the lack of success in the colonial advance. A renewed offensive was ordered, and again the Canadians were to attack K-5 with British units supporting on both flanks. How to rectify the failures of artillery in supporting fire, and how to deal with both the lack of surprise of their attack and the recent German reinforcement of the area, were problems left to a bewildered Alderson to solve. The 10th Battalion, having lost 18 officers and 250 men from other ranks, mostly from the two companies of less than 400 that were part of the advance, 
two additional companies of the 5th Battalion, and a small group of bombers were ordered to take K-5. The commanding officer of the 5th Battalion noted stoically that the miniature German fortresses, of which K-5 was the strongest, were nothing short of unbreakable. Massive artillery bombardments would be needed to smash the strong points, but the pitifully few field guns and howitzers afforded to the operation were insufficient. As the soldiers of the 5th Battalion passed by Brigadier Curry's command headquarters on the way towards the front, Private E. G. McPhee saw the large Brigadier kindly patting men on the shoulder and saying in a sad voice, Now boys, don't forget, I am relying on you. McPhee was touched by the Brigadier's compassion, but wrote that the citizen soldiers who filled the ranks knew only too well the tremendous peril which awaited them. Backed by almost no artillery support, the infantry could rely only on themselves and their own ingenuity to survive the next 24 hours. Ross rifles and bayonets were no match for the weapons of the dug-in German defenders. But the Canadians had also been busy building their own miniature artillery in the form of hand grenades. Canadian trench entrepreneurs had followed the British lead in the black art of bombing. The hand bomb had been out of service for the British infantrymen for more than a century. But the new obstacles presented by trench warfare demanded a return to old weapons. Specialists in the infantry, along with engineers, constructed bombs in the trenches and behind the lines by stuffing jam tins with nails, bolts, shredded gun cotton, explosives, detonators, and handmade fuses. These weapons were known by many names, but perhaps most affectionately as Tommy Tickler's artillery, because they were made from jam tins, often bearing that name. Enough crackpot weapons were designed in the trenches, from supposedly bulletproof shields to various forms of slings and catapults, for officers to turn a skeptical eye to these handmade bombs lit by match, pipe, or cigarette. But they soon proved their worth, especially in clearing enemy trenches. Nonetheless, they were notoriously unreliable weapons. The fuses burned quickly and they were, initially, almost as dangerous to the thrower as to the targeted victim. Corporal W. S. Lighthall of the Royal Canadian Dragoons rem remembered eyeing the bombs with trepidation, considering them very dangerous weapons in untutored hands. Men with such untrained hands soon lost them, along with most of their upper body. Even among experts, the weapons could be deadly. Lieutenant G. B. Glasgow of the PPCLI rejoined his unit after being wounded and was appointed bombing officer. He was more than a little shocked later to hear from a friend that the average life expectancy of bombing officers up to that point in his battalion was 16 days. Despite the dangers of the job, the bombardiers often attracted good men looking for a fight. Private W. H. Ray noted in a letter that, I love to build my own bombs, crawl into no man's land, and toss them into German lines. The best part was watching the way the German shit flies. As grenades became an essential trench weapon, the grenadiers who had been pulled out of their infantry companies to create a specialist force at brigade headquarters were embedded individually back into the companies by 1916. That same year, 
Most infantrymen went into battle with a handful of grenades as a secondary weapon. By the next year, the grenadiers were considered so important that one-fourth of the men in each platoon were designated bombers. The grenades had many variations, but they could be placed in one of three categories. Percussion, ignition, and mechanical. Percussion grenades were made active by removing a safety pin. They exploded on impact and were dangerous to the thrower as a backward knock against a trench wall during the throw could set off the grenade. Sometimes these grenades had streamers to guide them in flight and ensure they landed nose down. Using an ignition grenade involved lighting a fuse in the same way as a Molotov cocktail. Lighting each grenade took time and they were unreliable in muddy and wet trench conditions. Very quickly, almost all grenades became mechanical grenades, which had spring-loaded mechanisms that ignited a fuse and detonated several seconds later. The best British grenade was the number 5 Mills egg-shaped bomb. Introduced in March 1915, but not available in sufficient numbers until later that summer. The Mills continued to be manufactured in tremendous numbers before reaching a high watermark of 800,000 per week in July 1916. Its metal exterior had serrated edges that allowed the grenade to be in one, hand, in one hand while the other pulled the safety pin. As the mills left the hand, the lever flew off, setting off the striker, which commenced a five second fuse leading to detonation. An exploding grenade could shower an area with dozens of whirling metal bits of fragmentation, although more often the grenade exploded in larger, uneven pieces that were fewer in number but more deadly if stopped by flesh. Any grenade that landed within three meters of an opponent would likely fill him with some metal. One Canadian infantryman wrote, They are very simple in working, but terrific in effect. The explosion is awful as the metal casing covering the bomb splits into makes about 12 uh, makes over 20 pieces which fly in all directions the number 5 mills was an effective and deadly anti-personnel weapon the bombs were carried in a special in special bomber pouches around the midsection and sometimes if attackers were trying to hold a trench and expected to go through bombs in great numbers in green canvas buckets. Experienced bombers had their own methods of quick delivery. They would bend the safety pins to allow for a rapid pull-up to effect continuous delivery. Unfortunately, that some, they sometimes forgot to straighten the pins after a battle, making the explosion of grenades in trenches a not uncommon occurrence. But they were robust weapons and could withstand a surprising amount of jostling and rough handling. The grenade was essential in clearing the narrow, winding enemy trenches. Experienced bombers and bayonet men trained together. Angeli Yeo, a 22-year-old school teacher and amateur rugby player from Victoria, British Columbia, described breaking into the enemy lines. The bombing party consists of a number of men armed with hand bombs who are immediately preceded by others with fixed bayonets. Bombs are hurled over the heads of the latter, pe pe of the latter people at the enemy. The demoralized survivors of which are summarily dealt with by the bayonet men. Trench after trench, 
was cleared in this way in many battles, and frequent battles took place between bombers from the two sides, with bombers throwing their own grenades, catching enemy grenades in return, and then tossing them back before they exploded. A deranged game of hot potato. Experts could catapult a grenade 30 to 35 meters, throwing them not like a baseball, but more like a cricket ball with a straight arm. Towards the end of 1915, the grenade was modified to be fired from a rifle to achieve a greater distance. This revolutionary development armed the infantry with access to controlled firepower, in effect placing a dozen small mortars in the hands of a platoon. But no rifle grenades were to be had at Festive Earth, and so the infantry relied on armed power to project their bombs. On May 24, the Canadians were again ordered to capture K-5. Scouts and officers patrolled the front on the night of May 23rd and came away with grim findings. The ground remained a glutinous mess. Ditches crisscrossed the battlefield, and an advancing formation would be forced to climb in and out of holes and depressions which would likely break its coherency. Despite these warnings, however, the attack was not called off. Battalion commanders were pressured by brigadiers who were pressured by divisional headquarters, which in turn had pressure from corps and army commands. The attack would go forward. But again, the battalion commanders, with tacit approval of Brigadier Curry, committed only limited resources to the seemingly forlorn operation. Two companies of about 400 men from the 5th Battalion would lead the assault. Officers hoped to inspire the grim-faced rank and file by urging them on with battle cries of Lusitania in recognition of the recent sinking of an unarmed civilian ship by a German U-boat. But the soldiers needed more than battle cries. So badly was the ground cut up that the infantry carried foot bridges to lay across the swamp. One infantryman testified, it was a difficult thing to know exactly the position of the enemy. The attackers went in nearly blind and the artillery was completely sightless, doing very little damage to German defenses or defenders. The infantry took matters into their own hands. With no hope of suppressing the enemy fire, Lieutenant Colonel Tuxford of the 5th Battalion ordered a radical night assault. The two companies of this battalion's infantry were in the front lines 60 minutes before zero hour, which was set for 2.45 a.m. Harold Baldwin whose war was about to end when a bullet would nearly sever his ankle, requiring an amputation of his foot, wrote, Here we waited in silence for the word. The steady hammer hammer of the light guns, the monotonous bass muttering of the heavies, the shrill hysterical crackle of machine gun and rifle, and the shrieking and crackling of bursting shells seemed to be seemed to sing Hell's Requiem to us poor mortals waiting. My God, that waiting. At such a time, man's trivial thoughts sink into utter oblivion, and the naked soul shows bare. As minutes ticked down, the artillery barrage stopped, and the officers shouted, Over the top! The men of the fifth charged forward, and surprised the defenders, who neither expected an attack nor had the willpower to defend against this desperate push. The Westerners bombed their way through the enemy trenches, and ferocity carried the day. By 4.45 a.m., Curry received information from runners that the 5th now occupied portions of the enemy's trenches. 
but the battalion was now was desperate for reinforcements, having lost more than half of its force. Enduring a hurricane of enemy fire and several counterattacks, the battalion, the fifth battalion, held on until three companies of the seventh battalion and one squadron of the Lord Strathcona's horse were rushed forward to consolidate the front. K-5 had not fallen in the attack, but the Canadian advance had made it untenable for the Germans. As a result, the infantry was able to enfilade the powerful redoubt with rifle and machine gun fire, forcing the Germans to abandon it. The K-5 strong point was thus swallowed by no man's land, a fitting testament to the futility of the battle. Haig now ordered a series of further assaults into the German lines to see if the enemy's corps was rotten. Unfortunately, it was not. The Canadians' probing attacks were shot down by enemy fire. Even the Canadian Cavalry Brigade was thrown into the line, but the commanders were wise enough to realize that horses would last only minutes in the killing zone. The cavalry went in unmounted to join their infantry cousins in experiencing a terrible battlefield of mud, corpses, and unrelenting fire. The Battle of Festiburt proved that the infantry needed assistance in crossing no man's land. Artillery support was essential to destroy barbed wire and drive the defenders into their protective dugouts. Without such support, further attacks would only lead to slaughter. To date, this frightening truth had not stopped the High Command from continuing to order assaults. But on May 25th, the British Commander-in-Chief, Sir John French, came to the conclusion that no further fighting would dislodge the enemy. The Battle of Festivert thus ground to an inglorious end. At the shocking cost of 2,605 casualties, the Canadians had inched their way 600 meters forward on a 1.5 kilometer front. More than four men had been sacrificed for every captured meter of muddy ground. This casualty rate was just less than half of that suffered by the entire Canadian division at Ypres, but came with none of the glory. Canadian and British troops deserved better. The battle, as characterized by Brigadier Richard Turner, was a pure bloody mess. Confusion and incompetence reigned at and behind the front, although both Curry and Turner had objected strongly to the operation, they had been overruled by higher levels of command. The British and Canadian artillery had proved ineffective, firing short and inaccurately throughout the battle and being wholly outclassed by the enemy. The ordering of these operations in the face of unsuppressed enemy machine gun fire, with riflemen firing over open sights and through uncut barbed wire, was reprehensible and had resulted in nothing less than butchery. The Canadian and British attack doctrine would not improve much over the next three weeks, and on June 15th, a small attack by the 1st Brigade against Givenchy, just south of the Festivert battlefield, was another futile affair that resulted in several hundred additional casualties. But innovations had been attempted. Cleaning the welding of protective armor to the field guns to allow them to be brought forward, thus enabling the firing of shells more accurately into enemy lines, and 
the detonation of explosives under the German position through a mining operation. The latter proved devastating to both sides as the force of the uncontrolled blast collapsed trenches and killed at least 50 Canadians as well as a higher, although unknown, number of Germans. But the Canadian infantry were shot to pieces again as the artillery were plagued by a shortage of shells and by faulty fuses and were therefore unable to do any significant damage to the German defenses and barbed wire. As at Ypres at and Festiburg, communication was continually severed, leaving troops isolated and vulnerable in the enemy lines once they had sacrificed so much to cross the killing ground. Initially, the successful Canadian break-in attacks were decapitated and then driven out by fierce counter-attacks. The key to battlefield victory in the coming year would be the efficient training and marrying of artillery and infantry into a coherent mailed fist that smashed enemy strong points, allowing the infantry a fighting chance at crossing the killing ground and then helping them hold captured ground against enemy attacks. Since late April, the Canadian Division had suffered more than 8,500 casualties in two battles, in which its involvement had spanned about 10 days. Mostly, most infantry battalions had lost between two-thirds and three-quarters of their men. For thousands of Canadians who had enlisted in the heady days of August 1914, impelled by adventure, glory, or patriotism, the Western Front proved little more than a charnel house. In a war not short on terror, brutality, or horror, the Battle of Festivert marked the most callous sacrifice of Canadian lives. This ends the information from Tim Cook's book, At the Sharp End. Aftermath. Casualties. The British lost 16,648 casualties from May 15th and 16th and until May 25th. The 2nd Division lost 5,445 casualties. The 7th Division lost 4,000 123 casualties. The 47th Division lost 2,355 casualties. The 1st Canadian Division lost 2,605 casualties. The 7th Meerut Division had 2,521 casualties. The German defenders had about 5,000 casualties, including 800 men taken prisoner. French casualties during the Second Battle of Artois were 102,533 men and German casualties were 73,072. Only one Victoria Cross was awarded for the Battle of Festiburg. Frederick Barker of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers for actions on May 16, 1915. Commemorations. The 100th anniversary of the battle saw a range of commemorations held across the world. Some of the most poignant were those held in the Highlands of Scotland. In particular, in shinty playing communities, which were affected disproportionately by losses in the battle. Sky Comanche and Kingusi Comanche, representing two areas which lost a great many men, were joined by the British Forces Shinty team, Scots Comanche, for a weekend of commemorations, lectures, memorial services, and Shinty matches on the weekend of May 15th to 17th, 2015, in Portree, Isle of Skye. A week later, 
the Bewley Shinty Club, renamed their pavilion after the Patterson brothers, Donald and Alistair, who were killed in the battle and were part of their 1913 Comanche Cup winning side. Donald's bagpipes were recovered with his other effects in the early 1980s and were played at both commemorations.